The goal of this presentation is to give you a big picture overview to the Teacher Performance Assessment, or TPA. This screencast guides you through the TPA handbook structure, helping you have a handle on all the resources available to you in that handbook. Before you come to the Student Teaching Kickoff on August 9th, you should plan to spend two hours reading the TPA handbook and reviewing the templates. While you watch this screencast, I'll be referring to the TPA handbook and templates in your content area, which were sent as attachments in the email with the link to this screencast. Download them to your computer, and you may want to print hard copies. The handbook provides detailed guidelines to prepare your TPA, and the templates are Word documents that you'll download, write onto, save, and then upload to submit. The TPA is a National Assessment of Readiness to Teach. CU is part of a 20-state consortium participating in a national field test of the TPA, and you can see the other consortium members on the map on the slide. By performance assessment, we mean through the TPA you will be documenting and analyzing the work of teaching three to five lessons in your student teaching classroom. The TPA it will be one measure CU uses to make a decision whether to recommend you for an initial Colorado license. So why is CU doing the TPA? First, the TPA is a new performance assessment modeled after the National Board for Professional Teaching. To be a board certified teacher is one of the highest honors possible in our profession. Thus, the TPA is an ambitious effort to build an assessment that sets a rigorous national standard for entry into the teaching profession. Second, we think the TPA is a meaningful performance assessment that will help you gauge strengths and weaknesses in your teaching. So far, CU students who have field tested the TPA found it made them think about the craft of their teaching in powerful ways. Third, in doing the TPA, you will demonstrate and showcase your current abilities as a beginning teacher. And fourth, the TPA prepares you for the kind of evaluation environment you will likely encounter as new teachers in Colorado, particularly as Senate Bill 191 rolls out. Finally, we want to launch you on your way to becoming a highly accomplished teacher, one who is aiming toward board certification later in your career. Of all that you learned while doing the TPA, most important, you'll be asked to think deeply about how your teaching impacts your students' learning. You'll also have a chance to synthesize and apply what you've learned in the program and many of you will build new technology skills. We're finding that what you learn and do in the TPA translates well into giving pointed answers to job interview questions, particularly ones that ask you about how you engage students, guide learning, support English language learners, differentiate instruction, and know when your students have and have not learned concepts and skills. The TPA is a focused look at three to five hours of connected instruction, which is likely to be part of a larger unit of instruction. There are four tasks comprising the TPA, and within each task, you will provide evidence of your teaching practice. And I note this evidence comprises both artifacts of practice, for example, lesson plans, video clips, student work with your feedback on it, along with reflective commentary that has been guided by specific prompts in the TPA handbook. There are a total of 12 rubrics used to assess evidence of teaching practice presented in the TPA. And finally, throughout the TPA, you will show your abilities to assess your students' language abilities, to determine language demands of the tasks you have them do, and to support your students' academic language development. The work you did in EDUC 4023 or 4351 will be directly relevant on this last book. To complete the TPA, you'll draw on or build technology skills related to video recording and preparing digital documents. You'll need these skill sets as practicing teachers. While we will have video cameras available for checkout from the campus, you may prefer to use your own camera or one from your school. If working with video is a new skill, you may schedule one-on-one -on -one tutorials on campus in technology labs. Some of you may prefer to enlist support from non-CU friends or family who can support you with technology, and now is a good time to seek out those resources and set them up, letting them know you're going to tap them later. We've learned from the spring field test that we need to build in some time for you to be able to get to campus to access tech-related resources. So we are building in several work days in September and October to give you time and space to complete your TPA and meet deadlines. As I made visits to classes last spring, I announced there was a fee to register for the TPA. However, this fall, Pearson is not fully operational, so there will be no registration fee for fall 2012. You will submit your TPA to see you only on a DVD, and guidelines for that DVD submission are on the Student Teacher Research page on our School of Ed website. Your TPA will be evaluated by your supervisor and is a major part of your seminar grade. 
You will not pass the seminar and therefore will not pass student teaching if you do not submit a passing TPA. Student teaching kickoff begins on August 9th at 8 a.m. in Humanities 150. Take some time now to get ready for the TPA. Waiting until the first week of student teaching is a recipe for a stressful disaster. Review thoroughly the field test handbook and templates. Bring copies of them and questions on August 9th. In elementary, there's a TPA for literacy and one for mathematics, and your supervisor will determine whether you're going to do literacy or math and let you know on August 9th. If you plan to use your video camera, get familiar with using it, or talk to your cooperating teacher about using one at your school. You'll be teaching your TPA learning segment in the second half of September, so talk with your cooperating teacher now about what will be likely curriculum topics then. And finally, gather materials and resources from your teacher education courses, especially books, bookmarked websites, readings from EDUC 40 4023, 4351, or 5485. Those are the classes that addressed most specifically differentiation and differentiation for English language learners in particular. For example, if you learned about PSYOP, find and organize your PSYOP materials over right now so you have them handy when you start student teaching. Flip to the table of contents found on page one. Let's start getting acquainted with the TPA by pausing this presentation to take a few minutes to scan the major headings in the table of contents. As you do, note the similar subheadings for tasks one through four. Now turn to page three, which summarizes the handbook structure. As a reminder, the TPA documents a learning segment, which is three to five hours or lessons of connected instruction and there are four tasks that comprise the TPA. Each task has four sections, what to think about, what do I need to do, what do I need to write, how will the evidence of my teaching practice be assessed. All the additional resources are hyperlinked in the final field test handbook. Pages four to six provide assessment components at a glance for each of the four tasks. These are helpful advanced organizers that summarize what to do, what to submit, and which rubrics are central in the assessment of each task you'll find you frequently refer back to these. Now let me break down the organization of each task in the handbook as they follow a predictable pattern. Each task is organized around four questions. I'll use task two as an example in the next four slides to show you the basic organization. So flip to task two in your handbook. It should be around page 13. The first question answered for each task is what to think about. And this section in the task orients you to the aims or learning goals for the task. The what do I need to write section of each task outlines the prompts you'll answer in the commentary for that task. These prompts are repeated later in the templates. The guidelines in this section tell you exactly how many pages you have for each commentary. For example, the instruction commentary is four single space pages. While reading this section for each task, circle the verbs as you go, noting what thinking moves you are being asked to make. For example, are you being asked to explain how, cite, describe how, etc. In addition, underline or note what you think you are being what you are being asked to describe, provide evidence for, explain, or analyze. The circling and underlining will help you pay close attention to exactly what's being asked in each commentary. The second question answered for each task is what do I need to do? The steps outlined in the checkboxes are usually organized chronologically. What you want to do is read through all the steps carefully and keep thinking as you do about how what you do in one task relates to what you'll do in another. For example, when you're choosing activities while planning the learning segment in task one, think carefully about what you have to video record in task two. The last question answered in each task description in the handbook is, how will the evidence of my teaching practice be assessed? This part tells you which of the 12 TPA rubrics will be used to assess the artifacts and commentary produced for that specific task. The 12 rubrics for the TPA are found after the glossary section in the handbook. Each rubric has a similar structure and I'll describe some key features of the rubric structure using rubric 9 as an example. So turn to that. First, each rubric has a focus and essential question. For rubric 9, the focus is analyzing teaching effectiveness and the essential question is in the brown box, which says, how does the candidate use evidence to evaluate and change teaching practice 
to meet the varied learning need. Second, each rubric specifies performance levels running from one to five. The levels characterize a progression from early novice to accomplished teacher. And here's a way to think about the levels. Level one is not ready to teach. Level three is ready to teach with induction level support, and so that is where you should aim to achieve on nearly all rubrics. Levels four and five describe practices of a veteran teacher to a master teacher. And I've heard some describe level five as, quote, a room where no one lives. That is, even masterful veteran teachers do not live at a five every lesson in every day. But veteran teachers live at level four and make regular visits to level five. So on most days, a veteran teacher, if we were using this rubric, would demonstrate a level four performance and in some categories, a level five. The big point that you should take home is that you are not likely to score a four or a five, and that's a bit of a paradigm shift. The vast majority of you will demonstrate level three performances, and there may even be some level two performances on some rubrics. And the idea of landing at a three but being able to see where you are headed for a four and five is to show where you are on a developmental progression from becoming a well-started novice to an accomplished teacher. Third, as you read the descriptions of performance levels, you'll note how the rubrics are additive and analytic and how they move from a teacher focus to a student focus. For example, in the analysis of teaching tasks, one prompt asks you to consider what you would change if you were to reteach the lessons to the same group of students to improve their learning. So when a scorer reviews your response to that prompt, they would rate it a level one as in not ready to teach if the changes proposed don't relate to students and their learning. They would rate it a level two if the proposes focus on technical features of teaching, such as directions and time management. Then a level three would be used if the teacher is beginning to look at collective learning. And levels four and five show a teacher who is looking not just at the collective students, but at individual students in an increasingly more differentiated way. So to summarize, as you look at the other 11 rubrics in the TPA, you'll see these same key features. You'll notice a focus, an essential question, and performance levels that tease out an analytical progression that moves you towards more sophisticated practice and that shifts your focus from one on the teacher to a focus on individual students. The glossary of terms is found after task four and is hyperlinked throughout the document. The glossary explains key terms such as academic language or central focus of a learning segment, etc. Many of the glossary terms describe or explain features of academic language so it can be a helpful resource. The final pages of the handbook provide evidence charts. Evidence charts summarize both what to submit for each task and the specifications for file format, naming protocols, file length, and text formatting. With regard to text formatting, I note, for example, that all TPA commentaries need to be written in Arial 11 font. These standardized specifications are important as they ensure an efficient functional upload of the TPA tasks to the Pearson platform, which is where you'll submit your final TPA. I note that overall, you will submit 25 pages of single-spaced commentary in your TPA, and that commentary does include the prompts themselves. In addition, you'll submit supporting artifacts such as lesson plans, video clips, and student work with your feedback on it. Now that I've walked you through all of the elements of the handbook from the table of contents down to artifacts and commentary specifications, I want to take a moment to talk about the templates. This slide shows part of a template. Templates are Word documents you will download, write onto, save, and then upload to submit. Each has the same structure. And I'll use Task 2B Instruction Commentary as an example. The brown box provides specific instructions about how to use the template text formatting instructions, page length, and the file format instructions. The bold numbered items are the specific prompts you respond to, and these correspond to those in the what do I need to write section of each task. The red shows where you will insert your text. And while the TPA results in 25 pages of written text, the genre is not a research project or an extended essay. The writing task is to provide focused, incisive responses to specific prompts. And the prompts will press for description, explanation, 
and analysis of your teaching and your students' learning. We look forward to seeing you at 8 a.m. on August 9th in Humanities 150. Bring your TPA handbook and questions. And if you've not already done so, we flashed up here the School of Education website student teacher research page so that you take some time to review all of the materials, including the student teaching handbook that are placed on this page. We're really looking forward to seeing you and to partnering with you in this coming semester so that you have a terrific start in your career as teachers.